Okay, we have Aristo with us this morning. It's 9.33 my time in the morning. 9.34, you, you messed up. Oops. <laughs> well, okay. Well, you put the recording. It was 9.33 when, I, when I, I pressed the start exactly. recording. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, we haven't really talked much. He was a little bit late arriving at the Internet Cafe. And... Uh, we're going to let him go away. We did two. Vi I did two videos yesterday, so uh, one with the ambassador that I wasn't planning on doing, uh, and then of course the one where I challenged the cabal. But uh, we're going to let Aristo talk about wherever he wants to go this morning. And uh, Aristo, please, uh, happy New Year first of all, and take it away. <laughs> happy New Year, Ron. Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, we finally have an image, and hopefully the sound isn't too bad today. Uh, it was 9.30. Okay, let's talk about signs and portents um, because of the stuff that the ambassador said and the video that Ron made earlier, uh, the theme of spiritual warriorship, stuff like that. But uh, signs and portents, what are they um, and how can we handle them? Let me take an example. It was 9.33 when Ron told me, okay, let's do the recording now. I was completely unprepared, of course. We had not even said hello, you know, elaborately. So <laughs> as soon as he pressed the recording button, it went 9.34 right on the transition. So that was something that's a minute detail. It doesn't matter. Okay, who cares? Or another person would say, oh, you know, it's 934 now. I didn't see 933. But, you know, so, so you didn't really do it at 933. The power of the number didn't, didn't go. So what's going on here? I mean, this is a sign and a portent. These are the signs and the portents that are important. For me, the ones that we're not supposed to see. The ones that, that are normal that flick by our awareness. And I'm not saying, you know, I've known people who said, oh, you know, I heard a bird chirping towards my left at certain time and that means something or uh, somebody sneezed as they were three and a half feet away from me walking with, you know, two steps a second. I don't know. But, um, and you get obsessive. What do I do? How do I do this? You know, listen to your feelings because your feelings are going to disregard the unimportant stuff. Your feelings are going to be overwhelmed by the dramatic stuff. And then somewhere in between, there's a very subtle, subtle spectrum, a subtle area, an in-between zone, an intermediary zone, where things can be interpreted as unimportant, but at the same time, they are not dramatic. So this is the reliable zone, in my opinion, what I would call the reliable zone of synchronicity, the reliable yeah. zone of sign and signs important portents so we might you know call this video the um the fallibility or our signs importance reliable and how much or something like that anyways we'll figure it out <laughs> but I've, I've written a few things down so far okay i, I don't want to say something though you know it's interesting because back in late November, early December, I was seeing sparkles like in the air. When I would be out driving my car, I would see sparkles. And I mentioned it at a party that I was at. And since I mentioned it, I've not seen it ever again. And I was seeing it for several days in a row prior to mentioning it. Uh, and And it's interesting that as soon as I shared taking notice of it uh the 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 whole thing stopped and i don't know what the heck that means but that came well, to me when you said we pay what we pay attention to why did it come to you again there's something important here you remember what if you have let's say you're starting a relationship and it's just a, and then you go tell everybody and then it gets sabotaged or you're starting a new venture and it seems okay you know a creative venture and don't they say well you don't want to jinx this you don't want to tell people too much because you don't want to jinx this. That's not just a superstition. Basically, when you take it out from your internal bubble of perception, because although we're connected 
uh, it's like a, a radio frequency band, a radio frequency spectrum, but we're all tuned into our own individual bands, and there's the public band, and there's the private band. So our thought process aren't just open to everybody. It's not we're uh, on some level, yeah, you can open up and perceive the whole thing. But there are personal levels of thought vibration, thought expression, feeling, and all of that that can be tuned into by people who are intimate with us and or maybe nobody else, depending on the privacy level. And there are more public levels of thought expression, more collective levels. So don't think this collective zone has uh, complete access. That's what they want. They want to hack our minds down to the private level of access. But if you take something that's going, and the private level of access is also the reality we create. I mean, they say we create our own reality. And we misunderstand it because we think this should occur at the collective level. It doesn't. Our collective level is hijacked. We are basically prisoners at the collective level. However, we are still free at the private level. There are levels of privacy. It's like being in a prison but having your own little hideout that nobody knows. And you could actually go and go out in, in a limited way. But you have to go out naked and you, and you don't have clothing. So you can't the temperature and the, the weather and all of this. You don't have food. So you got to go back to the prison to eat. You got to go back to the prison to, to get warm. But you can still go out in a certain way. That's how the private level functions. We can, you know, go there, but somehow we cannot connect it to the quote unquote normal way of life. Now, what I'm saying here is stream of consciousness. I had no clue I'd be talking about this. I didn't even <laughs> think about this exactly. But there is a level of perception where what you said, uh, just all of a sudden certain lights went on and said, okay, now talk about this. Because if you, what happens, what happens, and I've thought about this, but never came up to a definite conclusion because, you know, I wasn't that interested. But since you are, all of a sudden I have a conclusion. And that's what sometimes happens. It works subconsciously, and okay, when you really need it, here it is. The sparkles were, I heard other people talk about sparkles. Some people close to me, they say, I've seen sparkles in the air. Uh, one person basically was, you know, trying to connect with nature spirits. And said, okay, give me a sign. And all of a sudden, the snow in a, in a rectangular shape, which is the earth element, uh, you know, started sparkling intensely from somewhere, you know, this was in the forest, and somehow the moon shone through the clouds or some light came on far away, something. And they say, oh, it's just a coincidence. Not if it's uh, tied to a significant event, a significant transition, something that could be a message usually is because you are the one creating that reality. You are the one creating that opening through your desire. So we do create our reality at the private level, but we don't have collective reality access points to be able to make it. Nobody else could perceive those sparkles. Even if they were there, they may perceive it. They'd interpret it differently, and they would sabotage the event because they would plug in a collective level reality frame. The collective level reality frame is the matrix, and it will always, and the matrix is way beyond just an electromagnetic thing, because we, if our minds are enslaved at the public access level, then our thoughts are creating a slave reality. We are the ones who are creating our slave reality. That's why they are harvesting us constantly. They haven't just harvested us 10 years ago, and now they, they were slaves. Right. They, they need constant, we are not. You know, it's not like the, our, their batteries are charged. <laughs> right now, at the transition between ages, they need to upgrade the system or the system is going to collapse. And that requires a multitude more of harvesting power. So if you're going to address the system, you got to understand what harvesting is and how it works. Now, in your case, you were seeing sparkles. You need, if you want to interpret what the sparkles are, well, the sparkles, you know, how did they make you feel? Did they make you feel good? Did they make you feel uncomfortable? What was going on in your mind at the time? What questions did you have? What signs and portents did you want to see? You know, let's say, oh, I need to know that we create a reality. I need to know that there's spirit around me. I need to know, it, does God listen to me? You know, and says, yes, at that private access level, God is listening and talking to you, but you are co-conspiring with your jailers to create unwittingly, for the most part, 
a reality frame where God doesn't exist. You know, you are kicking God out. Basically, your own circuits have been hijacked and are creating a reality frame where you will constantly be disappointed. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this in the context of the phoenix that uh, the dragon family saw in China and uh, interpreted and got really excited about it. And yet when the ambassador, of course, shared that, some people said it's just the smoke. And, and you know, most a lot of people made comments just poo-pooing the idea that it had any meaning or significance at all. But to the ambassador and to the family, it was a sign from God. Oh, exactly. But there may be other things going on there because that's not a private channel. That's a public channel event. That's a collective event. And we need to understand this, that uh, collective events, in my opinion, should be taken with a grain of salt, always. Poo-pooing them is not taking them with a grain of salt. That's, that's crapping on them. That's a whole different story. However, very interestingly, I, I tend to, there, there's a site that, that photographs clouds and looks at cloud formations and with various shades and infrared. And then what I also, and, you know, they, they have some, you know, out-of-the-box interpretations of things like that. Especially with the chemtrails, clouds have become completely different with all the metal particles. Plus, if you got metal particles in clouds and then you throw harp stuff at them, you can, you can basically sculpt whatever you want. Now, the funny thing is that if you look at the satellite imagery, infrared especially, because that shows where the energy is accumulated in the cloud layers, um, whether it's because they're cold because of height or, or some other reason or maybe beam, you, you notice cloud formations that are very, very interesting. Now, in the past days, between Christmas and New Year's, I was seeing phoenixes, not quite a phoenix, you might call it, like bird formations and dragon formations encircling the United States. You know, weather fronts, there was a big phoenix over the Pacific, some bird formation, but it was more like an ibis with a, with a big beak. And uh, this was facing China. And then there were dragon formations moving or released from this thing. But you could see the clouds moving underneath and through the Atlantic down and basically around the United States for the most part and in the Atlantic. Now, you know, people were saying, oh, extraterrestrials and this or harp and what does this mean? I'm saying, look, I've been listening to Ron Van Dyke and the ambassador and all these things about China. For, this, for some reason, it clicked that what this means is that there's, you know, China is in some way. And I've said, look, it can be harp. It can be this or that. But for some reason, the occult interpretation is more instinctive in our beings. I mean, there was a time when we didn't have technology, a shamanic interpretation. Let's call it that. It's more, it's more instinctive, and the shamanic level of reality existed before the matrix. It was the natural matrix humans used to make, you know, where that was the first organized matrix. And, and at one time, that organized matrix was benign. And then over the time, it became corrupted. In the mounds all over the world, for example, ley line nexus, you know, they were controlled. Temples were built. Belief systems were pumped into them. That affected the, the whole spectrum of energy over, the, over geographic areas and controlled people's thoughts. Uh, the same thing with sky energies. People worshipped the star, said this star is this god, and told people the mythology of the god. And so people believed it in that context. Their frequency spectrum was shifted through their belief systems to only access a certain narrow wavelength of what they got from the sky energy and what they get from the ground energy. And then that's what's going on now is doing this in a far more radical and sophisticated way, you might say. More specific, but still, the original empowerment needs to be supplemented with technology now. They don't have a shamanic empowerment, but we do we have a potentially latent shamanic empowerment. So one thing that you described too is maybe we are more shamanic in nature as a collective than we think we are. And if that is so, it's something we need to explore. We don't need to get into advanced metaphysical stuff, advanced occultism, advanced yoga, all of these things. We'll just get some knowledge, but the idea is to understand the shamanic pathway because that's the most primordial. It's the most earth-oriented. It's the most natural expression, the oldest one, the basis. And it's not dogmatic. That's the most important thing. 
I mean, you don't have to go and, and dress up like a Native American and, and dance around the fire. You know, we're talking primordial, instinctive. What would you do if you had nothing? Just the, the skin on your back and, and you know, the basically being in nature. And then take it from there to your urban environment. There's such a thing called urban shamanism, suburban shamanism, you know, <laughs> even matrix shamanism. You adapt to your environment. So if you look at it like a shaman, what would a shaman say? Well, they would say Ch the Chinese are sending spirits to America, dragon spirits. The dragon is moving, you know. So one asks again with shamans, do the spirits work inspire the shaman or does the shaman control the spirits? Are the spirits the ones giving the commands and the shaman is saying, yes, spirits, I'm obeying? That's the religious viewpoint. However, if you look at shamanism, shamans were very pragmatic people. They're the ones that had spirit allies, and they told the spirits what to do, you know, in exchange for whatever, energies and, and you know, offerings and things like that. It was a very pragmatic thing. Animism is not a religion. You don't worship anything. You revere and you're nice to it, and it's just basically how you have cordial relations with other humans. Animism, again, as I said, is not a religion. There is no worship involved. There is no submission involved. It's an egalitarian relationship between man and nature and the spirits of nature. So a spirit basically, if allied to a human being, partakes and sometimes embodies their own soul nature. That's what humans can do. Spirits basically are not individuals. Nature is not individualized. The planet may be as a whole, but you don't have, you know, tree, Joe Tree. And, and James uh, Bush, and, you know, only people have... Oh, stop name. talking about the Bushes. We bushes. Got to yeah. <laughs> no Bushes, okay. We're going to the forest. <laughs> so, basically, trees form a collective mindset. Uh, species may be individualized as entities. However, there's far more of a collective uh, species over mind type of thing than in human beings. Human beings are far more distinct. And thus, if a human being connects with a spiritual or entity framework, that entity precipitates through the human being and gets to feel what it is to be like an individual. And that's a big deal for the entity and it promotes its own evolution. It gets an identity. It's like, I am this now. I am this entity because the human being observes me as this entity. The human being validates me. Humans basically add them. What did Adam do in the Garden of Eden? He gave everything Named a name. All the animals. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What were the, the animals existed before Adam gave them a name? Why would he give them a name? Just to keep, keep track of them? You no, know, that, that gives them control over if anything you can name, you can, can control, right? There you go. Supposedly. Supposedly. However, the name is not a, a verbal analytical. It's a vibration. He felt the nature of the animals. It reflected in his own individuality, and that cycled back to the animals, and the animals became more individualized. They became more distinct. He created the reality of the animal's manifestation a step beyond where they were before. It's almost like God say, okay, I'm going to create this here up until this point. Why don't you fill in the details, you know? Do this, you know. Let's be co-creators. From the very beginning, naming something is participating in creation. You don't control the thing. That's, see, that's the sorcerer thing. That's the matrix thing. It's not for control. It's to uh, precipitate it more, to give it more substance, to give it a, a more defined context. It's to refine it. So if you name something with love in your heart, you are not controlling it. You're basically opening a pathway for its individualized expression because you're doing something that they don't have. You're giving it your humanity. Just as humans you, there's this big saying where spirits having a human experience etc okay basically we're spirits having an animal experience not a human human is the merger between the spiritual and the material and the animalistic so we're humans having a human experience however animals having a human experience are the ones where the spirit of higher individualized consciousness comes in so when you name an animal, you give them a part of that. What did God do to Adam when Adam came up? He breathed into him the spirit. And so image and likeness. What do human beings do? They, it's like a step-down transformer. So they have that spirit. They breathe it into a, an, an animal or entity or whatever. 
and they give it life in a much more deeper, more refined context. And they also invite it into the human version of perception and reality. And the human version of perception is a fusion between the angelic and the animalistic, between heaven and earth. Those are entities of earth. They partake in heaven through the human in some way. Entities that are of the spirit realm partake in matter through the human being. Human beings call down spirits. Let's put it that way. That's what shamans do. They the spirits are everywhere. They always work. But it's always in a natural ecosystemic group dynamic. Human being so can we create spirits whose job it is just to eat the cancer? Yes, that's, that's what, what I think the spiritual. That's what I envision the spiritual warfare. Yes, that's called, get rid of this called, cancer called the psychopathy. Those are, well, that's the Psych, thing. The psychopath, psych or psychopathic leadership. Yes, you you can do that, but you have to know the level of transformation that you're going to do. But I want to say one more thing. So if you have dragons around the United States. You know, you got to understand who created them and why and what the essence of it is. So if there are shamans in China, for example, that are working against the Western cabal, they will try. But and and they will try to do that. And if these shamans are in China and doing that, then their activities may be assisted by their own harp dynamics and things like that, because usually these kinds of collective formations with so much chaos are not easy to manifest in this world. Uh, you do so much and so much and should be so spiritual, for example, and yet you're still snowed and, and backsliding. Well, that's because this is a chaotic system, much more chaotic than before. So these people who have finances and all of this use high technology to supplement, in my honest opinion, occult activities. So they're sending a message saying, you know, it's not like the cosmos said, okay, this phoenix has risen, in my opinion. It's like those who are intending the phoenix to rise, projecting it holographically in some way and telling the people the phoenix has risen in a way that touches their deep collective mind. So they're emotionally reacting and supporting it. And so there's a kind of plug into our belief system. So we open up this timeline. It's, it's something more along those lines, in my honest opinion, especially since it's interesting that Pope Francis, you know, whatever he else may be, this guy's telling people to pay carbon taxes. You know, and all for Agenda 21. So uh, that's why I said grain of salt. And then that, yeah, and, and if, I didn't realize he was telling people that, but if it is, that's on Alex 21, Jones. That's, that's slavery at a worse level than we've ever experienced as humans. Exactly. He's telling people that global warming is the big issue of the century and that we should all contribute. It's going to third world countries and that, yes, if goal, we have to do something, which means we have to obey the treaty so-and-so, which means carbon taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And change it's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, they're trying to use uh, the, the global warming crap, which is bullshit, to do Agenda 21. So it's really interesting. But the thing is, like I said, I believe there's a level of interaction among the so-called elite classes, as they call themselves, and another level of interaction between the so-called elite classes and the people. So what do the people have to access to think that, oh, the cosmos has given us a great sign? I think that the cosmos is working through us individually, and it's up to us to name the situation like Adam did. There's no point if the cosmos is going to do it, it would have done it. It wouldn't have dragged our, our, our asses through the mud like this. The cosmos is saying, look, you are the cosmos too, people. You know, the cosmos isn't just, so the cosmos has been fragmented. Heaven and earth have been fragmented by this power mongering that's still operant. And whether some factions say, oh, we want to remake the connection, you know, they want to remake the connection, yes, but it seems to be in their way, on their terms, uh, how they understand it, how they value it. You know, whereas we, the people, are constantly either put into the role of invest in us as investors or harvested beings, either one or the other. Conscious investing is better than being harvested because you give more of yourself. So it's a higher value, let's say. But or, you know, we're just being sidelined and told to be spectators. So what can we do? Well, the shamanic level tells you this, you know, well, what is your own private awareness frame the details i always valued what you told us ron about your health being able to get your car started events like uh you know the flame and what you see in the flame the the sparkles 
Now, these are very, very significant events. And if you want to have your esoteric latent activities, you need to feed those. The, the, again, you go, what develops? Well, whatever you nourish develops. So, but the collective level is always trying to be big and brawny and overwhelming and dramatic. And then you have the other side, the analytical level that's conditioning as well, that tries to tell you it's all bullshit. So we're caught in the middle of this, you know. And in the middle, whenever you have a private thought and you express it verbally to the collective, you name it, then everybody else renames it. And whether you do it to people or, or obsess over it analytically, that's another thing. Sometimes it's below the level of consciousness and it works out. We have a desire. We don't even know we're trying to fulfill it. We don't even know what we're doing because if we did, we'd sabotage ourselves. So things <laughs> seem to work out sometimes, <laughs> you know. But we are doing it. And that's the thing. You may be creating reality, but you may not be creating the reality you want. And the reality you want to create, and to the extent you are creating it, you may not even be aware that you're doing it. So we're like asleep, you know, very heavily. Those of us, I and mean, yeah, it's what everybody says, but they usually say that for people who watch the mass media, you know, and believe in football and politicians and, and the justice system and all that. You mean no. you don't believe in football? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the team and all that. Root for the team. And that's the mentality. So whenever you see uh, 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 somebody saying root for the team, in my honest opinion, again, because obviously some people are going to say, oh, we have to connect and make teams. And no, the teams are competition. There's always competition. If there's competition and not synergy, if there's the enemy and the, you know, because it, there is no enemy, really. This is a cancer. Cancer is not the enemy. Cancer is, is a cell in your body that has mutated because you fucking have not been living naturally, you know, because you've been repressing your own emotions, because you've been taking in toxins by your own choice, whatever. You know, wittingly or unwittingly, from your body's perspective, you've been acting like a jerk to it, you know. So part of the body says, I can't take it anymore, and mutates and turns psychopathic and says, well, I'm going to eat you up then. And, you know, this, this, this repression may have happened many, many years ago, but the point is it, it may not even be terrestrial. We may be the creation that is evolved in order to deal with something something else has done, and yet at the cosmic level is still part of our being. So we are responsible for it, even though we are not to blame. So we say, well, I haven't made a choice to be here. Well, your little restrictive awareness that's asleep hasn't made a choice, obviously. But how do you know? Have you expanded to your full potential? How do you know what choices you've made and not made? A baby isn't expanded to its full potential, obviously. So it's ignorant. We can see it. We cry, oh, innocent. You know, but if you could expand the brain of the baby into an adult brain, give it a lifetime of experience where it instinctively remembers its potential, let it DNA, its DNA expand, it becomes an adult, it remembers. It's still the same person. So saying, well, babies basically are disconnected from that. You know, you can't, you can't ask them to be responsible, but adults, they may not be plugged into themselves, but they have all the outlets and all the plugs. You just need to find the right plug to the right outlet. So we need to be sophisticated and clever. We need to be wily as serpents and gentle as doves, as they say. But at the same time, the feathered serpent is the real template. It's the serpent with wings. It's whatever they said Lucifer originally was, the one that told Adam and Eve, hey, man, eat the apple, because that gets you out of this nice, comfortable little prison, which is a garden and very nice. You're going to have to go into the wide world and you're going to have to fix it. You're going to have to name it. And then the names may not be good. They may not feel good. So you're going to have to reorganize the situation so you can give it new names. You're going to, this is what you wanted from the beginning when you were adults. Hey, God, let's go down and let me create too. Sure, you know, and, and because it's in the image and likeness, but it ain't going to be easy because if you're going to create, you're not going to create out of nothing. Imagine how that would be. You're going to create out of a concept that needs to be transformed. And you're going to have to confront everything against it because from becoming a creature to becoming humane and a co-creator, that's stress. You know, it's not easy because you have to alter your very identity. And, you know, let's just put it this way. And this is just one way to look at it. The whole reason is so we don't blame our condition because we can't make any progress if we blame our condition. We have to say, this is what it is. I'm here. And now I'm going to move to deal with it. So, 
the <laughs> see something intervened and then you say who was that what did they want i didn't you even know. give it a chance to get the caller id part <laughs> you know i just and, hung up even so you know something intervened at a certain point and created a ripple in in my train of thought for example and it wasn't just because it took my attention away it was because you know something broke it in the same way that may be a teaching if we have questions and we completely pay attention to our environment and listen to our feelings we get answers and why don't we get them that way why can't they just give us a phone call or send us an email or something or whatever some way we can understand because that domain is hijacked you know we need to do work with what we have and the fact is you know that if you have a lot less sometimes you can do way more because you're forced to to pull up all of your hidden resources you're forced to do things you know you can do way more if you don't use a calculator you know your your mind becomes more creative and more intelligent if you actually do your own calculations if you do your own thinking than if you use a computer and become dependent on it it may seem that you do a lot more with a computer and objectively you do but over time you become dependent and atrophied so we need to step back not from technology so much and the world around us but our addiction to our reality frame and look at things from a magical point of view like we did as children you know and not see monsters around every corner because on one level of our reality we do have a sanctuary we do have it and sometimes that sanctuary superimposes with the rest of reality and this is where the reliable signs and portents occur like you with the sparkles a seemingly insignificant event and yet you know something happened that drew your attention to it the event of the sparkles being eliminated from your consciousness from you know that you didn't see them anymore when you that was just that was part of the event yeah. It wasn't just it, it, and it had been happening for probably a week at, at least every t every time I'd go out and drive I'd see these things but as soon exactly. as I as soon as I vocalized and told somebody else about it uh, you know way, way back when I used to have dreams of you know sometimes I'd have this very vivid dream of waking up uh, when I was connecting with something wanting to connect with something wonderful empowering and then I'd have this crazy dream. It was like inserted, like a slideshow, as if these, these people with weird robes were, were playing with a, a control board saying, oh, no, he's waking up. Shut him down. Shut him down. You know, and then these weird ripples would go out into my awareness and a burp, oh, nothing to see here. It's all normal. You know, and I was seeing this continuously, and it was a message, and I could feel it. And over time, I'd get constant, you know, things like that. You know, something, in my opinion, was saying, look, Ron, you know, there's more to your perception than you think. You're far more connected than you think. You know, there is a connection. You are getting something. Why don't you pay attention to this? You know, but then it taught you that, look, you know, that if you go tell people, it's going to be eliminated because it's something's, oh, look, he's trying to create a connection. Cut him off. Subconsciously, just people's dissonance, you know, small choices that everybody makes. They're harvested energy. When, you har when your energy is harvested, it's not just taken out of you and put into a, a energy bank. It's harvested within you so somebody can actually use it while it's in you and move your awareness to do things you think are normal, but, you know, end up shutting other people down, end up shutting down timeline probabilities, end up shutting down, you know, potentials for, you know, something to develop. And on your level, it may be just, oh, my God, this, this coup d'etat is going to happen. Oh, no, I'm scared. You know, we have to shut it down. And then poof, all these people who were just, you know, threatening the system on some psychic level are shut down because a million people all of a sudden thought the same thing. And so, but they cannot access your private level of awareness. That's the thing. And we need to be able to honor our ability to be introverted where nobody else can access and build from there. We need to look at the details. It's everything you've been saying is true. In so far as the internal stuff before, before, you know, all of those uh, due dates have disappointed you. How did you think before, you know, not, not the 2011 disappointment? How did you think before the 2012 and the 2013 and the Rusa and all of that? There was a part of you that actually was very optimistic, but it was a little flippant because it hadn't been tested, you know. 
it hadn't been tested by the fact that, look, you know, this is enough. It's not going to be easy. You got, you're on the right track, but you need to strengthen this, you know. But as soon as the challenge of strengthening it came up, as soon as the idea that, well, this could be hijacked, infiltrated, whatever came up, then it was too much trouble and it wasn't going to work. However, I do believe that a lot of your strengths lie in that original, not, not uh, you know, naive optimism, but in a sense of your own goodness, the tapping into your own potential, your own positive outlook that's self-generated. It's not basically dependent on what you see out there, and it's not fooling yourself either. It's your own heart. Your own heart is pro-life. If it's pro-life, it's going to be optimistic, you know. We are taught to be objective and realistic because we're afraid if we're not, we're going to be deceived and betrayed, you know. But that objectivism becomes a belief system, and we're, you know, until we say that the world is like this and nothing can change. And thus, we're creating the reality. We're co-creating. This is where the positivists, now the positivists have something in that that say, oh, be positive and all of that. But they've been so messed up that they're saying the wrong things. You know, they're trying to probably promote this intuition that, yes, you have a power in you and that power is positive. How do you bring that power out and start influencing things? You don't do it by being purely objective, but the world is fucked. I can't do anything unless somebody else does something or some higher power or some other power, but you're sabotaging the higher power because you're blocking it from yourself, you know. Mm. And, and so the positivists come along and say positive thing and give a bad example. They just escape. So then, you know, they make you throw the baby out with the bad water. You know, you're looking for some inspiration of what is this to bring it out. And the people who are supposed to be inspiring end up saying things in, in such a way that they're just saying, well, and, and because if you're not positive, they're critical. Oh, you're being negative now. Hey, man, you know, instead of being positive toward me and helping me, you know, deal with this negativity, you're either being, you know, passive aggressively nice or you're being passive aggressively hostile. Either you criti they criticize or the ego, you're, there's the ego again. You know, come on. <laughs> you know, what That's kind of, the games we play in our full spirituality. <laughs> exactly. And it has the total opposite effect. I mean, where's the empathy? If you really feel somebody who's screwing themselves, why don't you empathize? Feel their pain. What would you do? Would you push the pain away? Oh, yes, that's what I would do. Well, you can't give them advice then because pushing the pain away ain't going to do it. You need to dissolve it. So, yes, we do need a psychic immune system. But before you go out for them, before you send a servant, because you know what they can do? They can take any thought form you make, rename it, repurpose it, and send it back to you. And you're screwed because you got, they, they've tapped into you psychically now. They got the line. So, you know, I would say be very careful. And we need to make the, the, our knowledge a cautionary knowledge. We need to understand how they do these things. We need to understand how they can screw us if we end up, for example, that John Lash thing, the Kali warrior whatever, you know, movement thing. You know, it's like, well, in my opinion, there's just too much... Um, too many elements that can be corrupted in there. There's too, no matter how many contingencies he tries, you know, like sex magic without love, you know, you know, just taking the energy and using it just like they use our energy. They're harvesting us. They're harvesting our sexual energy. They're harvesting it all, whether it's in our bodies or outside of it. And they're using it against us. There's no love in it. Um, are we going to do the same thing? And are we going to harvest our own energy and use it as a power source to do whatever? You know, without love, it ain't going to work because it's self-similar to what they're doing. We're no different from them when we do that. It's not a bad or good thing. It's, it's a healthy or unhealthy thing. Does that mean we have to be monogamous? No, we can't. I, I challenge anybody whose heart is big enough to really intimately love many people and be honest about it. Let's see. Can you really do it? You're going to be tested. You know, you're going to feel jealousy. You're going to feel this. You're going to feel that. What are you going to do about that? Unless you're tested in that crucible, you're not going to develop magical abilities. And we've been in that arena. We are in that arena. Before you can develop spiritual powers of, to access the planetary immune system and boost it, acts because the planet has its own spiritual entities that are meant to deal with this cancer. It, too, has latent abilities. You know? And shamans would tap into them. And these characters are trying to sabotage that. The planet is very, very resilient. They can't. If they try to do that, you know, like some people say the super collider with the hadron, boson, all these particle colliders, what is that doing, really? 
you know. And my perception and a friend of mine's and some other friends, you know, some perception was that, well, they're hurting the planet somehow. They're creating a ring that's trying to poke into a level of reality where the planetary mind operates, trying to program it somehow. You know, I don't see extraterrestrials here. Uh, if, I, if they are there, they're on the outside shouting through this barrier, so-called, a psychic barrier. And the people, this, the cancer itself, is trying to find its mama, you know, its father. The cancer's father, you know, the cause that actually mutated everything. You know, let's put that the cosmic level event. But anyways, it's all about people. Extraterrestrials, good or bad, can't do squat. If the, good one, if the bad ones can come in, the good ones can come in. Let's put it that way. Because on this planet, it's self-similar. There's good people. There's messed up people. I don't care what the ratios are. It's there. So, however, the gateway, the true star gate is within you. The stargate is the heart, the, the body, the mind, all of these things. These are all cosmic gates. It is from here that everything is going to come out because we emanate timelines. We emanate potential. We precipitate reality frames. We just don't know how to do it. The how, point to, is, how to do it consciously. How to do it consciously. So I can't say, oh, how to do it because it's, you know, how do you grow up? That's like saying, or how do you become a teenager? How, well, <laughs> Before you access the planetary level, let me say this. Access the personal level. Beef up your own personal psychic immune system. Get yourself independent. Pay attention to those little events like you. All those little things. And don't make them public. Because you're, you're actually you're not inviting everybody to your holy of holies so they can have a party. You're trying to, to stir, make it sturdy and solid and defined. Name your own names. Do your own thing. Create just like Adam named the animals. Go inside and name everything on your own. Feel it. How does it feel like to you? You know, create your reality frame and be free of the implications of cultural mindsets and all of that. See if you can do that. And you will find a level of independence within you that's beyond religion, that's authentic, that's beyond the, the justice system, beyond the matrix, beyond all of that. And it will be a seed and you will feel that you will be challenged to cultivate an immune system of your own integrity. And as you do that, then your insights will expand beyond there a little more naturally. You know? But you don't have to confront anything in a way that you will feel at a disadvantage. When the, there may be a time that many of us may have to slip between the cracks and see that, oh, events are escalating. Oh, you know, there's suffering in the world. Well, look, you know, imagine all the time we've been wasting waiting for somebody else to do it, you know, or waiting for the event to happen or waiting for the time to be right. Right now, 2015, you know what it is? It's the year of initiative, you know, just like you have implied and others have implied. But whose initiative? Everyone's initiative. It's the year that the cabal and the anti-cabal and the trans-cabal and the meta-cabal and the para-cabal, all of these cabal species have, have realized that, uh-oh, we're sensing an initiative, energy of initiative in the human collective. We need to counter it or because our agendas come first, you know. The people never come first. It's always somebody who knows what's best for the people or who just wants to eat the people yeah, up. the insane people. Insane. Whatever. Some of them are insane. Even sane people think, you know, who are completely rationally, still have hidden things that they won't face, and they will face them in the end. The point is, if we face ours first, that will then give them the space to face theirs. So personal immune system, and even if you see things hopeless, just say, look, I'm still alive. The first thing to affirm in, in esoteric cultivation is I choose life. I choose to live. It's not like, well, it's all happening. It's all messed up. No, what do you choose? Keep choosing it. It's not going to have change unless you keep choosing it. Every, imagine every choice you make is an energy that's like a, a turn of a piston. When you start your engine, it doesn't just, you know, one piston turn and then it keeps running on its own. It's got to keep going. Pop, up, 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 and then the rev up and rev up and rev up. And then the wheels carry and it still turns. And your energy is feeding that. So you have your choice and keep making it every minute that you can. Affirm it, especially if you feel something is trying to deny it. And you will understand the collective pressure. You will feel as a tangible force what's working against you, and you may be overwhelmed, and you may already feel it, but that's good news because it means you're becoming more sensitive. You're feeling it because you know what it is. You're not just asleep anymore. You're really, really waking up. 
And then your power of choice will become stronger. But you got to lift the weight, you know, and that weight is not impossible to lift. It's just we are weak. We've been weakened. So let's strengthen. So personal immune system, in my opinion, comes first personal cancer before we address collective cancer, even if we have to slip through the cracks. Look what they're doing to you. They're trying to make, you know, every time you try to do something outwardly and make a move, your house is threatened. And you're put in a position of defense. And then you're, you know, all know and consolidate everything and then tense up. And then it goes away. And then again, the despair, depression, as soon as you start, your energies start expanding and I can feel it, you're affecting things. And uh, then poof, we're going to take your house. You know, it's like, well, that needs to be, you need to be able to move around and do shit without your house being threatened. That means being in control of the probability, of your own probability. And that means facing your own sense of weakness to, or your sense that it's impossible. Make choices where it really, really matters, where you're emotionally and, and physically invested and, and ground yourself into the earth and say, I choose, these people want to kill us, so I choose that they can't. I choose that I am remaining alive. I'm, you know, whatever they do, I'm not going to go out saying, oh, I could have made that choice, but I thought it was impossible, so I didn't. You know, I didn't invest in that energy. It's not just making a choice. That's what really upsets me with so many of my friends. I mean, I know so many people that have lost their houses because the, the courts and the banks, or the banks threaten through the courts, and the people just acquiesce instead of fighting. I mean, I've been fighting for 10 years. It's very hard to fight. I understand where they're coming from. Uh, and I, I can feel them. But the point is that your viable uh, uh, capacity for action occurs before the threat comes. You have to sense it before it comes over the horizon. You have to understand the energy behind it, the causality behind it. So people have been living complacently for decades before this economic collapse happened. They've been asleep and it, you know, it takes a slap in the face for the system to wake you up. And most often they've designed it so that slap in the face is lethal. Those of us who are still moving and viable and on our feet in some way are the ones who are most capable of making changes, but, and, but the other people also need to focus on their own survival and do it without compromising principles by making those choices. Choice doesn't mean acting out the choice. It means making it within yourself until opportunity arises, if it even arises. But keep so a lot of people are going to choose to check out you know, because there is such a thing as cancer going too far, you know, where it's irre irreversible, you know, where that is, nobody really knows. Sometimes you can have miracle healings. It depends, but we don't know what it depends on. We have to figure it out. But as we figure it out, we need to slip through the cracks in the system and, and consolidate our lives at least to a certain point where we can actually be standing up straight with dignity in a certain sense and we know we are creating our reality at least to a certain limit and then we can be able to and then other people will say well you have it good you didn't you're not dead yet you're not whatever you're not well because i work for it you know i know for myself i would have been then 20 times over over the past 20 years or 30 years if i had not been pursuing the path i did which means a lot of sacrifices in terms of conventional reality and it was an intense commitment. Other, I've seen other people come and go. I've seen friends die who were also committed, but they had blind spots. And so the point is that there are no guarantees but your own being. Your own being can guarantee it. If you can face everything and open up at your own pace and trust your own divine access, not the outside. No matter what the presentation is, reality is far more flexible than we think. It's just been frozen in place. So, again, let's deal with our own psychic immune systems first and then look to become the holy warriors, but it won't be long. Okay. 2015 is the year of initiative. Sorry for going on for so long. And it's okay. Well, it's been about four, just under 40 minutes, I guess. Oh, and okay. I, could, I could ask you lots of questions, but then it would make it go too long. So I'm not going to. Yeah, do yeah. Okay. Note the questions down, though. If you want to ask them in the <laughs> or later on, okay. that's fine. Well, well, thank you, Aristo. Right now, we're going to end the recording and say namaste to everyone. And <laughs> thank you. Namaste. We'll do.